Hey, welcome to Application Networking Foundations. Uh, my name is Tom. I'm joined today by Jamie. Uh, we're both principal solution architects, so we deal with customer network designs day in, day out. And in today's session, what we're going to do is we're going to provide a definition of application networking, what, is act what it actually is. And then we'll uh, talk about the building blocks that make up application networking. So we'll give you a really 10,000 level view of some of the services that fit under that umbrella. And the goal for us here is to help you find a direction. It's not going to be a deep dive. It's a foundational level session. But it should give you a direction on which service to select for which use case. The services will be split into two categories. We'll have uh, service discovery as well as service connectivity. And once we introduce the building blocks, I'll hand off to Jamie to show you some example architectures that are made out of those different building blocks. So what we're not going to cover today are the traditional networking foundations. So VPC, transit gateway, peering. Uh, if you are interested in diving deeper into those components, uh, we have a really good session from last year's reInvent that's available on demand. You can just catch up on it whenever you can. OK. So to better illustrate application networking, I want to use a, a TCP IP layers model. Uh, if you're from networking, you might be familiar with the OSI model. Uh, this is just a simplified version. It shows you the different layers that participate in forwarding traffic uh, between two different systems on the network. So we have a client on the left-hand side, and we have a web server on the right-hand side, and we have four different layers. And at the application layer, the client will formulate the request. So get a particular host name, a particular path. Once the request is formulated, it's passed down the stack to the transport layer. Transport layer is taking care of TCP, UDP, port allocation. So we'll allocate a source port. It will know that it's going to a destination. Uh, we'll have port 80. So those ports will be added to, to the packet. And then uh, that segment goes down the stack to the IP layer, where we add IP addresses, source and destination IP addresses, so that the systems can communicate. Uh, I'm kind of going to ignore the network access layer. It's not really relevant for this uh, talk. But traffic is going to use the IP addresses to get to the other side. And then the web server will uh, strip the IP layer, uh, look at the TCP ports, and pass it on to the uh, transport layer, strip the TCP uh, ports, source and destination, and then pass the request to the web server. So when we're talking about application networking, we'll be staying in the transport layer and the application layer. So that's where we're making intelligent routing decisions or forwarding decisions in your network based on transport or application layer. We're not going to be looking at forwarding traffic in a more traditional way using just IP addresses and sending traffic from A to B. And we do have an application networking uh, site. So this is a public website. Uh, where it gives you a bit of a definition of what application networking is and gives you some example services. We actually believe there's a larger number of services that really fall under the application networking umbrella that are not even covered on that page. And we'll, we'll touch on each one today. But before we do that, I want to do a quick recap on some of the compute options we have in AWS, because we'll refer to that. So if you're running an application and you want to use some of our compute options, you can even run a virtual machine using uh, Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, EC2. You can run a container, and we'll talk about what options exist for that. Or you can bring your own code. We have a serverless runtime with Lambda, so you can bring your Python code or Go code and, and run it in Lambda. If you're running containers, uh, we have two orchestration options. One is uh, relying on the open source Kubernetes framework, and the other one is uh, Elastic Container Service, which is more proprietary to AWS. And in each, though, each one of those environments, you don't actually run an individual container. The construct that you're running is either pod in Kubernetes, and we'll spend more time on that today, or task in the case of Elastic uh, Container Service. And a pod can have one or more containers, but just know that all of those containers are sharing the same networking stack. And often, it could be one container that's a web application and another container that's performing some additional function. Uh, sitting within the same pod, maybe grabbing logs from the web server. OK. So if we split our application networking services into two categories, we have the service discovery section and service connectivity. And we'll start off with service discovery. So service discovery is going to be all about finding where the service that you're trying to communicate with lives. 
And the example I'm going to use here today is a monolithic application. So what that means is that is an application that's running on a single compute. It's using the same runtime, so maybe it's a Java application. And all the services running on that application uh, are effectively different libraries as part of the same application. So if you want to make it change to a single service, you have to redeploy the whole app. And with a monolithic application, say this is a virtual machine hosting it, you have to have multiple instantiations for high availability. And then what you would typically do is put a load balancer in front of it to help you distribute the traffic. And we'll talk about load balancers a little bit later, but here I want to focus purely on the service discovery. So what we're using here for service discovery is DNS. So DNS allows you to create a, a zone, in this case example.com, and then configure records within that zone to point to your resource. So you can set up myapp.example.com and point it to your load balancer. So the client sends a DNS query, gets the IP address of the load, load balancer back, and can establish the connection. Now we have a managed service in AWS that takes care of DNS resolution and DNS hosting, Amazon Route 53. So you can use it for domain registration. You can use it for hosting domains, whether they're public or private. You can do things like health checking, uh, intelligent request routing based on uh, geography, for example. And it also takes care of in-VPC DNS resolution. So it's a slightly different use case, but that also falls under uh, the Route 53 uh, umbrella. And we actually had a session on Route 53 happening this week. It's already happened. Uh, Net 206, so I encourage you to check it out on demand. Okay, so let's have a look at a more complicated scenario. So in this case, we still have uh, multiple services, but now they're microservices. So maybe each one is running a different runtime. One is Java, one is Go, one is Python. Uh, they're running on different compute. So they're running on containers or maybe also on VMs. And uh, they will also have multiple instantiations for high availability. But now, this time, each compute hosting each service has to have multiple endpoints. Now, if you're exposing uh, your, your service through a load balancer, you might say, OK, service A is going to be my uh, front end service. So maybe that's hosting my front end of my application. And so it, that can still use the load balancer. And clients from outside can still use DNS to get access to the front end of your application. But where it gets more complicated is that service to service communication. Right? So now these services have to use the network to communicate with one another. They have different IP addresses and they need to figure out where each one is. So how do we solve it? Uh, we can use a service registry and have each one of our services effectively register with the service registry. I say, hey, this is me. Here, here are my attributes. Here are my endpoints. And if each service does it, then services can use that service registry to actually discover each other. So that's something that you would have to include in your application, that registration piece. And we do have a managed service in AWS that takes care of uh, service discovery that is AWS CloudMap. And AWS CloudMap operates slightly similar to how uh, you would look at DNS. There is still a namespace. In this case, it's example.com. But underneath a namespace, you register specific services. And under each service, you register each instance of that particular service. And you can uh, decide on your own attributes. So you can specify any information you want about that individual service. So if our client or some other service that you deploy an SDK for uh, tries to discover our services, it can still use DNS. So I can still send DNS requests to CloudMap. Uh, so I'm showing you an example with effectively doing a dig, which is uh, looking up a DNS uh, uh, information from a particular host name. And if I'm using DNS, I'm going to get an IP address back. So it's not super useful. And it's very similar to doing a discovery of DNS. Where CloudMap really shines is if you're doing your service discovery through API calls. So I'm showing you here an API call using our AWS CLI. But in reality, in production, you would be including uh, the discovery in your SDK in your application. And then what you get back is all of the information that you've defined in CloudMap. So you get all of the additional attributes that you're interested in. So an example here, we have a project name or we have a version ID. So as a client, I can decide that I'm only interested in endpoints of service A that are running version 1.1. So you have all the control on the client side. So how does it differ from DNS? Um, I'm not going to go through all of these points. I'm just going to highlight a couple here. Uh, the big one is, we already talked about it. It's the ability to include custom attributes. 
So you can include whatever information you want whenever you register a service. And the second benefit is with DNS, when you do DNS resolution, there's caching. So queries and any changes that are happening uh, might fall under the fact that some systems will cache the answers, and you have to wait for the time to live for, those, for that cache to expire before the changes uh, take effect. With uh, Cloud Map, you're using APIs, so changes propagate really fast. So within five seconds, you can, you can make changes. Now, how does AWS Cloud Map fit with Kubernetes environments? So here we have an example, uh, Kubernetes cluster. And uh, we were running some service, service A. And within the same cluster, there is uh, an inbuilt uh, service discovery using DNS within a Kubernetes cluster. For example, core DNS is one option. And then when services in the same cluster try to communicate, they would talk to core DNS to find out where the other service is. So you don't really need cloud map in that scenario. Now, when cloud map really helps is if you have two clusters and each one knows about only services that live within its own cluster, but you can use cloud map to share information between those two clusters and help them communicate. So now service A can discover service B and vice versa. Now, one thing I want to call out with service discovery is that it takes care of the service registration piece and finding out where the endpoints that I'm trying to talk to actually are but it's not participating in the service communication. There's nothing in the path of the traffic between your services. So for that, we need some kind of service connectivity component that could be sitting in the middle and adding some additional functions for us. So what I want to introduce is a proxy, and proxies sometimes get a bad name, but I feel like you should hug your proxy because they bring a lot of value for you. So in a typical communication, if we have a source and destination, and we have traffic going back and forth, uh, a proxy would be something that is deployed in the middle, and a source connects to a proxy, and then proxy connects to the destination on behalf of the source. And in some more complicated scenarios, we have a proxy on the source side, and then another proxy on the client side. There's different naming conventions for them. Uh, sometimes they're called forward and reverse, or egress and ingress proxy. Uh, a reverse proxy could be a load balancer, for example, and a forward proxy could be a proxy that you have within your corporation that's doing some kind of filtering. Uh, so why use a proxy in the first place? Right? Proxies give you the ability to have a bunch of additional functionality that you don't have to develop in your own application. So you can do things like uh, TLS termination, you can do health checking, load balancing, uh, tracing, all of those additional functions that you now don't have to think about putting into, into your application code. And if we look at our AWS services uh, with this proxy-based lens, uh, we have uh, a structure here with different types of services that operate at different, different levels of the TCP IP layer that we talked about earlier. So we have services like Network Load Balancer or Global Accelerator that sit in the transport layer, so they only focus on TCP UDP. Uh, we have services that operate in the application layer that are effectively uh, application load balancer, API gateway, CloudFront. And then finally, we have services that also live in the, in the application space, but they're not really uh, uh, load balancers. They're not really reverse proxies. Uh, and examples here are AWS AppMesh and a service we launched uh, on Wednesday, I believe, Amazon VPC Lattice. And we'll touch on each one today, uh, give you kind of a high-level overview. Uh, there's not enough time in this session to really dive deep into each one of them. What we'll do is we'll take our networking lens, and we'll look at each service from a network lens perspective. And then Jamie's going to try and put them together into, into an architecture. OK, so I'm going to start with uh, services that operate as reverse proxies. So they would usually sit in front of your destinations and uh, receive traffic from the sources. So the first example of a reverse proxy is a network load balancer, NLB. Uh, you deploy a network load balancer inside of a VPC, so that's your private environment in AWS, uh, and it will point to some targets that you it will navigate traffic to because it's a load balancer, and it's presented inside the VPC through uh, individual network interface per availability zone. It will get a static IP address per availability zone as well. So if we look at it from a network perspective, it operates at that transport layer. It Oh, by, but it allows you to do TLS termination, which is kind of a little bit outside of transport layer. It has that static IP address capability. Um, it also allows you to preserve the client IP address. So clients coming in from outside, uh, their IP address can be preserved all the way to the target application. 
And then from a target perspective, you can point it to EC2 instances, you can point it to IP addresses, uh, you can point it to an application load balancer, and I'll explain why you would do that. And then finally, if you're running containers, a network load balancer operates as a load balancer service in the Kubernetes space. So as traffic comes in from the outside or from inside the VPC, it would hit one of those network interfaces. The network load balancer only looks at the TCP and UDP layer. It will do some hashing based on the ports and protocol and the side on which target to forward the traffic to. Network load balancer also has this very cool capability to allow you to present its uh, listener, so the port it's listening on, to another VPC. So effectively, you're sharing a service to a consumer in another VPC. So those consumers can connect to your network load balancer without you having to create a, a full-on network path using, using VPC peering or transit gateway. And uh, there's a bunch of benefits here. So first of all, you don't have to care about overlapping IP space. Uh, even if the service consumer VPC overlaps with the provider VPC, private link is still going to work. Uh, only the consumers can initiate connections, so it's one-way communication. If I'm the provider, I cannot initiate connections to the uh, consumer VPC. Um, we're exposing only the individual port that the network load balancer is listening on. So if the network load balancer is presenting an application on port 80, that's the only port clients will be able to connect to. And finally, uh, it's using the AWS backbone to inter interconnect those VPCs, uh, and it's all happening within the same region. So that was a single region, single VPC. Say we have multiple regions, and we want to navigate traffic to, uh, to them from users on the outside world, users on the internet. Now, if you're using the traditional internet, uh, you might, the further away you are from the regions you're trying to get to, the more likely you're going to hit some internet weather conditions. And it's also pretty tricky to load balance traffic between different destinations. So we have a global load balancer service called AWS Global Accelerator. It operates on the premise of edge locations. So we have hundreds of edge, location, edge locations around the world. They present your application that you define through an Anycast IP address. Anycast just means that it's the same IP address advertised from every location. So your users always see the same IP address and they always connect to the same IP address regardless of where they are. And Global Accelerator also has the ability for you to control uh, which regions you want to use using traffic dials. So you have a lot of ability to define how the traffic is going to flow. So maybe uh, we want to take the region on the left-hand side out of action. Uh, maybe we're doing some maintenance. We can take the traffic dial down to zero. And then uh, traffic from the clients will uh, immediately move to the next available region that's closest to where the clients are. OK, so summarizing Global Accelerator. Operates still at the transport layer, so it doesn't do anything on the application layer. You get this Anycast IP address. You actually get two Anycast IP addresses. Uh, we support both IPv4 as, as well as IPv6. Um, supports client IP preservation. So similar to Network Load Balancer, traffic from those clients coming in all the way to the region will preserve that client IP address. We do some magic there. It's actually not very, uh, it's, it's pretty hard to do, but it, it works. And uh, where you can target our Network Load Balancers, Application Load Balancers, EC2 instances, but they have to live inside AWS region. OK, so let's move up the stack. Let's go into the application layer now. So we'll start off with application load balancer. Similar to network load balancer, it's a load balancer, so it lives inside of the VPC. But this time, it's not presented through a single network interface. There will be one or more network interfaces. So application load balancer doesn't have a static IP address. The IP addresses will change. So that's why if you need a static IP address, you may want to put a network load balancer in front of an application load balancer. Uh, it's focusing primarily on HTTP and HTTPS applications. So it has a lot of functionality with helping you make decisions based on information within HTTP. So headers, path, query string, uh, TLS termination, all of that is supported. Uh, it doesn't preserve the client IP address. So the remote users connecting to the application, uh, the IP address will not be preserved in the packet, but it will be moved to a HTTP header. So you can still see it, just not in the packet. And then from a target point of view, you can target EC2 instances, IP addresses. An interesting call out here, you can, you can target a Lambda function, as well as you can target containers. So in the Kubernetes space, uh, application load balancer takes care of the ingress uh, object. 
Okay, so as the traffic comes in, it hits one of those interfaces. Uh, application load balancer this time makes the decision on the application layer to decide which target to forward the traffic to. So you can forward traffic to different target groups, maybe depending on the path. So we really are scraping the surface here with the capabilities of our load balancers. Uh, so if you want to dig deeper into the differences between different types of load balancers, we actually have a really good documentation page that goes into those details. Okay. So staying still in the application layer, but moving away from load balancing more into organizing your APIs. So if you're looking at aggregating and uh, simplifying how you manage your APIs, you can use Amazon API Gateway. And you'll notice that API Gateway doesn't live inside of VPC. It's a service that's deployed into the region where you will define your APIs and decide how they should be consumed and what they should be mapped to on the back end. So if you're first defining how they are consumed, they can be consumed publicly with a public IP address using regional endpoint. You can also use an edge-optimized endpoint, which is making use out of our content delivery network service that we'll talk about in a second. And then if you want to present it privately into a VPC, so I have someone inside a private VPC that I want to expose my API to, you can do that with a private endpoint. And then on the back end, you can integrate your API with a bunch of different uh, uh, backend integrations. So it could be a Lambda function, could be DynamoDB, a simple storage service, or you can even point it to a load balancer that's in another VPC. So API Gateway is focusing on two different types of APIs, REST and HTTP APIs. Uh, there will be a static IP address if you're trying to consume it, but only if you present it into the VPC using the private endpoint. Uh, similar to ALB, it's not preserving the client IP address in the packet, but it will move it into the HTTP header. And then from a backend point of view, uh, you can pretty much point it to anything. Uh, AWS services, uh, load balancers, as well as any uh, HTTP endpoints, HTTP, HTTPS endpoints that you might have on, even on the public internet. Uh, so one big call out here and comparison that we often get is when would I use application load balancer versus when would I use API gateway if I'm pointing to a Lambda function, right? Both support Lambda function as the backend. So we'll use an example here. We have a post action and uh, we're sending some JSON with first name, last name, and some age. And we're sending it either to ALB and API gateway to then pass on to a Lambda function. If this is all we're doing, we should be using application load balancer. Uh, from a cost standpoint, it's gonna be more cost effective than using API Gateway. So uh, uh, if, if you're not doing anything more complex, use ALB. Now, as soon as you start doing something that's a little bit more complex, maybe instead of sending, sending the JSON to a Lambda function, you're sending it directly to our uh, NoSQL database, DynamoDB, or you want to integrate with any other service, or you want to do things like request validation, so maybe you want to check the JSON that's being sent and validate that uh, first name and last name that are required actually exist in the JSON. If not, it will be rejected. Or if you want to do mutual TLS, or if you want to transform the JSON that's coming in before it gets to your backend. Uh, if you want to do things like request throttling per API, per method, uh, um, or if you want to do advanced authentication, uh, in all of those use cases, you should be looking at API Gateway. So we touched on CloudFront a little bit, but I want to spend more time and explain what it is. Uh, so CloudFront is a content delivery network. So it's focusing on optimizing the experience of uh, applications running on the web. It's focusing on HTTP, HTTPS, as well as some streaming applications. Uh, and uh, the functionality that it brings uh, is very focused on optimizing experience. So it has an edge cache that will allow you to cache static content it supports TLS termination at the edge. It supports simple CloudFront functions, so you can run a little bit of code at the edge location. Uh, we, if you want to do more advanced serverless functionality on CloudFront, you can do Lambda at the edge, which will run the Lambda in the closest region to the edge location that the traffic is coming in on. And then you can also do things like AWS WAF to do uh, uh, some additional security. So as the traffic is coming in, uh, the traffic that is cached can be returned from the cache. The dynamic content is going to be going over our global backbone, which is congestionless uh, uh, connection all the way to the region. Uh, one thing I want to call out here is that the backend 
can be on AWS, but you can also have the backend for uh, CloudFront uh, anywhere on the internet. It could be running on your, in your data center on premise. So another common question we get is, what's the difference between Global Accelerator and CloudFront? They both have edges. They both utilize a global network. They both have some performance improvements. Uh, when, when should I use which one? Uh, the simplest answer is, if you have a HTTP, HTTPS application that will use caching, use CloudFront. For anything else, you can look at uh, uh, Global Accelerator. But I want to compare them side by side. So first thing is Global Accelerator supports any TCP or UDP application, whereas CloudFront is purely focused on HTTP, HTTPS. Uh, Global Accelerator has any cast IP addresses, so your users are connecting to the same IP address regardless of where they are, whereas with CloudFront, the IP address is changed, so we always have to use uh, DNS name. The functionality on the edges with, uh, with Global Accelerator is pretty simple. Receives TCP connection or UDP connection, sends it to the closest region, that's it. With CloudFront, we have all of the bells and whistles, right? Caching, TLS termination, uh, CloudFront function, Lambda at the edge. Finally, on the back end, Global Accelerator is really good at load balancing to different AWS destinations. So if you want to have active, active scenarios, active, passive, make decisions on how to forward traffic, Global Accelerator is excellent for that. Uh, if you're just sending traffic to, a, 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 to an origin, then you can use CloudFront. And we support both origins that are running on AWS as well as origins that are running um, on-premise. OK. So we talked about scenarios where we have a clearly defined sources and clearly defined destinations. And then we have a reverse proxy that adds some functionality in the middle. So what about a scenario where we have uh, our sources and destination mixed up? So some of them could be sources one time, then destinations. So it gets a little bit more complex. So the pattern that's available here is to set up proxies that are running really close to the sources or destination. This is really common with container environments where you would run a proxy as a sidecar next to uh, your actual application. And then the proxies establish communication to one another and effectively create a mesh. So you might have heard the term service mesh. And we'll spend a little bit more time on that. So we'll go back to the anatomy of the proxy. We remember the source and forward proxy, reverse proxy, and destination. Let's replace the source and destination with some arbitrary microservices. And let's put them inside of a container. So now we have a service inside of a container and a proxy inside of a container. And then if we're running Kubernetes, we can put them together into a pod so they're sharing the same network infrastructure. So the pod is now our compute unit. Uh, the application lives, or the service lives within the service pod. And then the proxy is taking care of all of the communication in and out of the pod. So if this is now getting scaled across a larger deployment, you would have multiple pods deployed on your worker nodes, which effectively are effect virtual machines. And uh, you'll have a lot of them. The proxies would register with some control plane to say, hey, this is my service that I'm supporting. Uh, and the control plane is now going to take care of the service discovery. And then the proxies themselves will take care of service-to-service -service communication based on that discovery parameters. So that all together really makes up a service mesh. And at AWS, we have a managed service that helps with uh, uh, running your service mesh called AWS App Mesh. Uh, it takes care of the control plane side of your service mesh. So we don't manage the proxies. The proxies still live in the containers. Uh, the, in that scenario, they're Envoy proxies. You still have to manage them. But we're taking care of the control plane that takes care of the service discovery within, uh, within that service mesh. And there's a lot of benefits of running a service mesh, right? We don't have to go to the central location and then spread out. Anything can talk to anything and use the proxies to do a lot of additional functionality. So we can do things like traffic shaping, uh, load balance to different targets, do blue-green deployments, weighted distribution. Uh, we can do path-based, header-based uh, uh, the delivery. We can support protocols like HTTP, TCP, gRPC. Uh, and then from visibility standpoint, those proxies give us uh, the richness of information of what's actually going in your environment, uh, from just logging to metrics and actually tracing a particular request through, through the service. So there's a lot, of, a lot of cool features with service meshes. Now, if you run a service mesh, whether it's an AWS app mesh managed one or, or, or one of the open source ones, uh, the thing that you still need to think about is the network. 
So maybe uh, the uh, Kubernetes pods that run on different clusters, then you need to put those clusters into VPCs. And if you want them to be able to communicate, you need to set up some kind of connectivity between those, uh, between those VPCs. So maybe run a transit gateway, maybe set up peering, but it's up to you to make sure that there's IP layer connectivity so that the service mesh can establish across all the network. So a lot of customers were coming to us and saying, okay, we like the benefits of service mesh, but could AWS manage a little bit more of that environment? Right? Could AWS take care of managing the proxies? We don't want to run the proxies. Um, and we also don't want to uh, be focused on building the network. Right? Why do our developers have to know what kind of network is running underneath and, and, and involve that in the, in the communication? So we did exactly that. We moved the proxies out and deployed them as a centralized AWS managed proxy that all the services com can communicate to and from. And the proxy will authenticate all the communication. And we'll go for an example, and I'll tell you what that service is. Um, so in a traditional deployment, say we have three VPCs, two Kubernetes clusters, everything is connected through some kind of transit gateway. Uh, maybe we have a service mesh across those two clusters, but then we have something running on EC2, um, some other application that's not part of our Kubernetes deployment. Um, so maybe we expose that for an application load balancer to everything else. Um, then maybe we have some serverless code running on AWS Lambda. So it's getting a little bit more complex. It's actually uh, really hard, if not impossible, to bring those things under uh, the service mesh. So with yesterday's launch of Amazon VPC Lattice, it's currently in public preview, we're simplifying that environment quite significantly. So there's no longer a transit gateway. There's no longer an application load balancer you have to deploy. Uh, there's a service discovery part of Amazon VPC Lattice. It's a registry where you define your services. So all of the services living on different compute platforms, whether it's Lambda, whether it's, whether it's uh, EKS, whether it's EC2, can be registered with that service discovery. And then for communication, we have the centralized proxy, application layer proxy that allows you to connect all the VPCs and uh, uh, enable communication between different services running on different compute platforms. And we're using DNS for service discovery. So when those services need to communicate, they will do a DNS lookup. Uh, Route 53 Resolver, which takes care of DNS resolution inside a VPC, will respond with uh, Amazon VPC Lattice as the destination for the services that are registered with it. And traffic is just going to flow to VPC Lattice. And as long as you uh, set up the right permissions using identity and access management, so it's using IAM instead of MTLS, you can establish that communication. So if you want to learn more about VPC Lattice, I actually got good news. This session hasn't happened yet. So it's happening tomorrow. So if you're still here tomorrow and you have energy after the party, uh, Net215, uh, you can still watch it tomorrow. If not, it's still going to be available on demand within a week. OK. And the final comparison I want to do is compare some of the services that are often used with microservices. Um, so with API Gateway, the common use case is that where you have the clients and destinations kind of clearly defined and you're exposing your backends through APIs that are running on an API gateway. As soon as we're talking about any-to-any -any communication, uh, where each service might need to communicate with uh, a mesh of other services, then you can start looking at things like the service mesh with app mesh or VPC lattice. So they're both for those east-west use cases. Where the biggest difference in is between Amazon VPC lattice and app mesh is how much of that service is being managed for you. With App Mesh, we're managing the control plane. With VPC Lattice, we're managing the control plane as well as the data plane. So we're setting up the communication between VPCs so your developers don't have to care about setting up transit gateways or VPC peering. Now, from a set of supported services, um, API Gateway supports any AWS-based services, so you can use it as a front-end to S3 or DynamoDB, whereas App Mesh and Lattice focus purely on services that you manage. Uh, with the big difference that actually you can bring Lambda-based functions into VPC Lattice, whereas you can't present Lambda with App Mesh. All right, so these were the building blocks. I'm going to hand off to Jamie to show you some example scenarios where we're using those building blocks and putting them together. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Hi, my name is Jamie, and I'm going to now play with all the toys that Tom just described. So I've got the easier job. Tom had the harder job of actually trying to go into each of those pieces. But he did stress on one thing that I want to also make very clear, 
is that this is a 200 level session, so we're here to show you these individual pieces. I'm gonna walk through um, an architecture that's gonna grow and become a little bit more modern, if you will, from a monolithic application to something a little bit more of a microservice or a modern application, as I mentioned before. And the idea is to plug in some of these things that, that Tom mentioned, and then you can later go and figure out all the other good features that we didn't have time to mention today. So as I mentioned, vertically scaled uh, application here. We've got our monolithic compute. This might have your web front end, your portal, all of that fun stuff in one big machine or one big EC2 instance. We have our service discovery, which we're using Route 53. And then we have an ELB of some, port, of some kind um, to bring in our traffic and distribute it um, between one or more of our monolithic compute pieces. So we have options as, as we're, uh, we saw earlier from Tom, we have our ALB, which does layer seven path-based routing. It has other features too, with like WAF integration. You can do authentication offload with it. Anything pretty much at the layer seven option that you're going to be using, ALB is your go-to. It has a lot of features that you can uh, you know, dial in and with the multiple target groups facing our backend uh, storage, which we're using for databases. Our second that we have, and you can go to multiple target groups as well, is the NLB, the Network Load Balancer. This has the long-lived connections. This is what a lot of our gaming friends like to use so that you don't get cut off when you have a new uh, uh, auto-scaled EC2 instance that gets added in the back end and then it reshuffles. It'll actually keep those connections long and, and, and connected. And then, of course, we have Private Link. Private link is, as Tom mentioned before, and I'm wearing the t-shirt today, see, get the private link connection. Um, so private link is, I had to put in that plug for our PM because he was saying, mention more private link. So private link gives you that connectivity between multiple VPCs, unidirectional stateful flow, right? Um, those endpoints that Tom had showed before that could be distributed around your environment, this is the thing that you would use with an NLB to offer that service. And then again, we still have our storage in the back end. Again, these are databases. So now let's take this logical diagram and apply it to something that we are more used to seeing within Amazon, our Amazon infrastructure. So I've got my Route 53. It's doing my name to IP address uh, translation for us. I've got an ALB sitting in front of my standard EC2 compute, right? And I've got my databases sitting in the back end for my standard storage. So now we're going along in our journey and we wanna start adding a little bit more capabilities to our application and our infrastructure. So we have a requirement to bring in uh, API calls, let's say. We needed to do some data transform. Um, maybe one of the entryways of, into our application could be something like receiving a text, but we have to make sure that that text data gets uh, normalized so that our application can handle it. And we'll add maybe a little bit of cache, like a Redis cache or something like that, so it could be stored in there for our application to refer to. So I'm bringing up Lambda and API Gateway for these two jobs. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that API Gateway sits in front. Not everything is a direct replacement for what we had before. So, you know, they work just fine together. Um, Tom showed a, a, a comparison between ALB and API Gateway, and I'm gonna show how they can work together in the same workload. So we have our requester, we have our, our short-term data store, uh, such as Redis, we're adding microservices, such as Lambda, and then we add our API Gateway. Our API Gateway is talking to our Lambda, we're getting our texts in from our input, it's sending it to our short-term data store, our monolithic compute can then read from that, do what it needs to do, store anything that the user is doing, everything is working just fine with this three-tiered web app. So let's take a look at what that looks like in motion. So here we are with what you've seen before, I've now added my, my service requester, it's going through our API Gateway, which lives in the region, I'm using Lambda, the function and features that Tom had mentioned about where it can actually live inside your VPC. And then we're sending it to our ALB. Our ALB is doing our load balancing for us. Maybe we have, again, some off, uh, you know, offloading or we have our WAF integration for some statistics and it's connecting to our standard RDS or our standard databases. Everything's going well now. But now our application needs to be deployed in our CI/CD 
in a faster fashion. So we're gonna look at using some kind of containerization. Anybody here use Kubernetes? Yeah, we've got quite a few. Um, containers, just in general? Yep. So we all know the benefits of what those are. You know, you have the ability to do your, your development in a similar environment. You can put it in a registry. There's lots of goodness that we can use. So we want to use that in our infrastructure. And we've chosen Kubernetes because we can't choose all of the things or you'd be sitting here forever or you'd all be walking out the door as I still am talking. So here we are. We have our, our deployment. I've uh, changed it over to Kubernetes. We're just going to call it app one. It's going to represent one app. There's pods inside. All of that fun stuff, we've got our Redis, our long-term data store, we're doing good. But we need to bring data into those containers, and we have an option for that. We have load balancer controller options. There's two, right? I'm not gonna read everything off on the slide, I'll just go um, and, and highlight it a little bit, but the native one comes with CLB, or classic load balancer. We're not getting rid of it right away, but we're not actively developing on classic load balancer. So all of those features that you get at layer seven from the classic load balancer, you're not gonna have as rich of an environment as say an ALB. And you can use an NLB in what's known as instance mode. So then you can connect your instances targets and you can send traffic. What we recommend is that you install the AWS load balancer controller. It needs to be installed but it gives you a couple of other options. You can share your ALB between services, and you could also use it for IP as a target. ALB is there, and NLB is there, no CLB. So if I'm gonna run down this thing, let's take our Kubernetes cluster. We're gonna populate it with our pods. We have our ports exposed. We're going to use our ALB as the ingress controller. We can get our updates. We can um, send back uh, feedback to our API server, and it's easily provisioned after you install it. So then I mentioned before that you can share a load balancer so you don't have to spawn a load balancer for every single uh, pod or every single application that's coming up. Again, we're choosing the application load balancer and I have slash app A, I'm gonna send it to port A, to pod A that's representing that. I have slash uh, B, same thing. And then as I mentioned, we have IP as a target. IP of, as a target is extremely fast it is low latent, so you can actually separate out your pods and your infrastructure based on what you need for speed or for growth and, and, and ease of configurations. If you want to know a little bit more about application uh, or the load balancer controller, here is the QR card. I'm sorry that I should have put that up earlier as you guys are taking pictures. You might have some duplicates now. Um, so now let's just change over our compute to pods, right? Nothing really new and groundbreaking here. We, it's still a compute architecture, but now our CI CD is a little better. So let's move on to breaking up into multiple services. Now that we have containers, we can distribute and have different teams working on different things. Our, our deployment is a lot quicker. So here we go. We have app one, we have our containers. We add, say, another microservice to do some, something that we wanna do on the fly. We add our second application. We add our third, and you notice that you have to maintain all of those connections. You have to maintain the connections to your storage, and you have to maintain your connections to the other parts of your compute and your app. We're still using our Route 53 for service discovery. We have our API gateway and our ALB for our ingress into our application, so all is good. But what happens if you start doing this more and more? So I'll do the same thing. I'll add my microservices B. We've already seen our app two. We add app three, and then we add app four, and then app five, and now you're maintaining all these individual connections, and you're also maintaining all the connections to your data store. So who can tell me what this kind of looks like? Spaghetti, <laughs> a mess. Right? And yes, I took a picture of this spaghetti, so you won't find it anywhere on the internet. You're more than welcome to copy it. So let's clean this a little bit. Right? We've got our cool toys, App Mesh. So here we are. I'm using App Mesh. Everything is connecting to the App Mesh in terms of our compute, all of our containers. For our API gateway to talk, we need an NLB for our ingress. And then our microservices are still hanging off our API gateway and their ALB. They don't connect into the app mesh. But this looks a little bit better, I think. 
When I add another container now, all I need to do, or I'm sorry, not a container, but when I add another cluster, all I need to do is point what I need to to the app mesh. The app mesh can then figure out where everything goes and connect it to my data store. So if we're gonna dig into app mesh a little bit, here we are with app mesh just kind of focused in. You'll see that I have my three different paths. I have my virtual services, my virtual routers showing my protocols, and then my nodes that connect up to my services. Everything is running well. I have my, my API gateway going through my NLB. I have my ALB. It's going into the app mesh. All is good. Everybody knows where everything is. So Tom had mentioned one of the cool features you can do with a service mesh is something like blue-green. So what does that look like? So if I'm going to take a look at I've got all of my ingress coming in, and I come out with a second version of app two, I can go ahead and wait what I want my secondary paths to be, add app two in, and then go ahead and start sending traffic to it. The other thing you can do with a service mesh that Tom had also mentioned is tracing. How many of you have gone through the scenario of something being wrong with your application, and now that your application is so distributed, you have to find out actually what part is causing that? Right? It's very difficult to look at it on a networking standpoint because networking-wise, everything seems to be going to the same thing or everywhere at once. So if I look at this environment and say, okay, I've got my service discovery running, I've got my API gateway sending traffic in, I'm going in through my load balancers, and then I notice that there's an issue, but I don't know what the issue is. Some of you might have already seen it on the screen, but let's start our trace, everything's good, we go along, and then we find we have an issue. The issue is, is that they deployed app two over app three, and it's not responding correctly, and that's where I know to look for my problem. So we're halfway there. We've discussed what we're doing with our application. Right? We're discussing about our compute connecting into a single service, such as an, a mesh, but our storage story still needs a little help, right? Everything still has to do all their interconnectivities to storage. So Cloud Map is a good example that Tom had brought up before that can help us with this. Our service to key pairs for Cloud Map will allow us to actually have our compute figure out where things are. So now we're essentially just connecting all of our compute to Cloud Map to find out where the storage is. And then if we want to make any ads and changes, we can do it there. So what does that look like? So here we are, we're running along just fine like we were before. We have all of our storage neatly laid out throughout our environment. It's very uh, uh, distributed through different AZs. We're doing all the best practices. We install our cloud map, and then we go ahead and we set up our key value pairs of where our schemas are, our databases, and then we distribute them within the rest of our environment. Now it becomes much easier for us, because as I mentioned, what do we do when we add a new DB or schema? Instead of going everywhere to every single machine, we want to have to go ahead and make our configuration changes. We'll add our database. We'll add our schema or our change or our version. We'll go ahead and make that manifest and then deploy that manifest to the machines that care about it. So now we've got more of a singular set, a more single place to go for our storage connectivity. And again, this isn't just for storage. You can use it for a myriad of other things for your service discovery. So this is looking a little bit better, but not necessarily super easy, right? We've got our spaghetti straightened out, but we're still managing all the strands. That's just the way it is. There's got to be something that we can do that makes this a little easier. And of course, because Tom went before me and he stole my thunder, we're talking about VPC Lattice, right? VPC Lattice will allow us to scale and it will allow us to facilitate communications in a more managed way. With the app mesh before, you were still configuring a bunch of pieces that you really had to get in there in the weeds and make sure that you knew what your traffic flow was going to be. I'm not saying you can ignore your traffic flow in entirely, but this will make it a bit easier. So now we're gonna add VPC Lattice to our logical diagram, right? And then you're gonna say, well, Jamie, that kind of looks the same. You know, well, how's that special? Well. Here's the new infrastructure that we actually deployed with an AWS. You'll notice that I am separating my ingress and my, or my front end with my back end, and then I've turned on VPC Lattice, much like you would turn on a S3 uh, gateway endpoint or DynamoDB gateway endpoint, and it will now allow my applications 
to find the rest of the other applications without the need of setting up any other type of crazy guardrails to get information to go through. The other change you should notice is that now I am no longer needing an NLB and my lambdas are connecting directly to VPC Lattice. So Lattice can handle lambdas as well directly. So let's take this a little bit further and say, well, I've, I'm now separating my environment so that I am using multiple VPCs. Maybe I'm getting around some limits. I want to do some form of, of um, small micro or cell-based architecture so that I can go ahead and visualize my logs, whatever it may be. But you'll notice that Lattice is still allowing communications between one VPC and the other, my front end and my back end. And you can go even further. Now we're gonna segment even more, right? We're gonna realize and, and utilize our, our multiple VPCs for a boundary for our application development. And there could be all sorts of lambdas involved, other things that we wanna deploy throughout this environment. But there's one thing that I'm not showing in this diagram with three VPCs that you would normally see in almost every other presentation here. Can anybody guess what they don't see between these VPCs? Transit gateway, VPC peering, exactly. We don't need those, right? Because VPC Lattice actually will do this for us in the background. Now, it's not necessarily at this point a direct replacement for all of your other traffic that doesn't need Lattice. But this could be very helpful if you think about it. I know somewhere, some people, nobody in this room, might have an environment that might be a little messy and is hard to make changes when you add applications. But if you had something like VPC Lattice and you pointed all of those to Lattice, enabling it in your VPCs, if you made a change in your transit gateway or you made a change with your peering, your, your applications are still gonna talk. Now, yes, your security groups are still important. Yes, you're gonna, still gonna have to pay attention to your VPC routing. You don't wanna you know, kill all that and say, Jamie said I could just do this and you know, your application goes down. But, in general, it makes your ability to upgrade and move a little bit easier. And you still get to enjoy path-based routing. You still get to enjoy setting up your listeners for where things go for load balancing. You still get to enjoy waiting everything you had before with AppMesh. But now, a lot of it is more managed for you. So now that we've got this all taken care of, our application, our internals of our application are looking great. It's a lot easier to manage. We're scaling well. What does our global reach look like? Now, Tom had given us a couple of toys for those as well. And the first one that he had talked about, we're gonna highlight today, or, or here. So we have a presence in the US, or we have customers who have a presence in Europe and customers in Asia Pacific. And they're all going after our back end because we're so popular. Everything's running so well, we're pretty low latent. But the thing that we notice is that, one, the distance, right, between our customers and our our back end could be, or our, our, our application, could be different for each one of them, giving them a different experience, right? Internet weather is what Tom had mentioned. Plus, now that we have so many people banging on our front door, we might have some congestion or more heavy, heavy demands on our infrastructure, which could increase prices. So one of the things that we can do is Amazon CloudFront. As was mentioned before, CloudFront will actually add points of presence as close as possible to your customers and allow that communication to go as quick as possible and then travel a shorter distance instead of to your entire region. Anytime you need to make a change to your CloudFront infrastructure, you can go ahead and make that change and distribute it out and your customers don't know the wiser and those changes go over the AWS backbone. Now, yes, there might be some things that you know, you have in your infrastructure or have in your application where CloudFront can't handle. And I didn't really represent those dots because at this point, we're hoping that it's not so much anymore where it's something you need to be concerned about. So the other thing that we mentioned too is availability, high availability and global reach. And Tom gave us another clue with that as well with Global Accelerator or AGA. So let's take the scenario that I'm in US East I'm, everything's working well. We're, we're really happy with our architecture. And then we're told that we're going to install something new into Ireland, maybe, or Europe, for a European presence. And because we want HA, we want to have everything in sync, 
we bring up another infrastructure that looks just the same as ours. We were smart, we used CloudFormation or we used Terraform or some form of infrastructure as code, so this is fairly easy to do. You'll also notice that our lattice is region bound. It's a regional construct, so we do the same configurations we did before over there. And then we go ahead and we turn on our global accelerator. Cool thing about that global accelerator, is, as was highlighted earlier, is you get a pair of Anycast IP addresses. I'm only representing one here, but we do have a pair. You get two separate ones because we're always that whole, everything fails all the time, and we want to make sure you're most protected. And that is installed on points of presence around the globe with two separate pieces of infrastructure that represents those IP addresses. And then the global AWS backbone, fast, performant, 100 gig dual backbone that we control, we don't have anybody else involved in that, will handle the traffic from the global accelerator, which is as close as possible to your customer, to your back end. And then traffic flows, right? So everything is looking good here. We have our environment. But one question you might be asking is, hey, Jamie, how is that highly available? I just saw two streams. Sure, you're sharing one IP address, but how does that make it better for me? Well, I'm going to answer you. We have our environment. Everything is working well. And then somebody somewhere unfortunately makes a mistake. It takes down your application. And now your users in, in Europe can no longer talk to that region. Global Accelerator sees this because it's inheriting the health checks from those ELB endpoints, those ALBs, and knows that it's down. So it'll go ahead and divert the traffic to the next closest available region. Your customers never know the difference. It's still up. So here we are. Now you go in and you fix it. You make whatever changes that are needed. It comes online. Your health checking now registers that everything is OK. Then there you go. Traffic starts going anew. So now we've gone and addressed our internal application, managing that internal application, and our global presence, and managing that global presence. No more spaghetti. Everybody's happy. And uh, now we're done. Thank you.